Greetings, sweet ones. I'm Andy, and there's no George. And welcome back to the Windmill Full of Courses. So, why is there no George, you say? Well, because I'm here to talk to you about a thing. A thing that I heard, and he didn't. So he would be rather useless. So, the thing in question is an album. And the album in question is Gods of Debauchery by Seven Spires. This band is quickly becoming one of my favorites, and this album is probably, probably, certainly their best one so far. It's the band's third album. It comes as a follow-up to the debut, which was so vague, concept-wise speaking, because it is a concept album, and all the albums are concepts. And the second album, Emerald Seas, was a prequel to the debut, so vague, and this, if I got it right, comes as a sequel to Soul Lake. So, a lot of concept nerdiness to unpack. But before getting into concept nerdiness, I would actually want to talk about the music itself. So, Emerald Seas, released early 2020, was easily one of my favorite albums of the year. It was really technical, really expressive, all musicians showed extreme maturity, a lot more than you'd expect for like a second album of a band. It's like, they haven't been around for that long, but they sounded real mature. They sounded like they could compete with the well-established and most known bands in the genre, genres, because they cover more. Um, and this one, this third one, coming less than two years after the release of Emerald Seas, is not a step forward, not a leap forward. It's like miles ahead in terms of creativity, composition, uh, expression, and just in the sheer scale of it. It is, it's an absolute colossus. It's nearly 80 minutes long, and every single second of those 80 minutes is fully engaging. It keeps you completely hooked. You do not get bored for that long. Not only do you not get bored, you actually want more when it's done. You want to hear it again. I know it because it happened to me. So I'm going to start by talking a bit about their technicality because I'm a nerd and I like technique. And these guys do it like hardly anyone else ever does because they use technique with a purpose. Like, for example, I really like technical death metal. And in technical death metal, everything is super precise and super mathematical. And it's something I love, actually. It's something that you also love if you, for example, heard Artspire, let's say. These guys can be just as technical as tech death bands on certain occasions, but they do it with a purpose. It always makes sense from an emotional standpoint. It's a tool, and that's to get to this extreme level of technique and to still have it make sense and be used as a tool, I think it's worthy of respect and something very few bands can do properly. So if you look at drums, Chris Dovas, this guy is an absolute monster. When it comes to double kick drilling, when it comes to blast beats, he absolutely slays. It's obliteratingly fast. It's head altering, but at the same time, it always makes sense within the context of the song. If you listen, for example, to Shadows on an Endless Sea, it's probably the fastest song on the album, not only drum-wise, but specifically drum-wise. If you listen to this song, the blast beat feels like a storm. It's, it's, it's like you're on a storm at sea. It gives a mental image. Well, the image comes from the whole soundscape, but as an effect, the technique used on the drums is perfectly used to illustrate what the song expressed. I'm not sure if that's actually the scene within the story, but it is what shows up in my head. I haven't, I haven't looked into the story. I don't know what's actually going on, but I do have an idea of what the flow of it is, let's say from an emotional or psychological standpoint. But I digress. Back to technicality. So Dovas is a beast when it comes to double kicks and when it comes to blast beats, which are, I would say, the core foundations when it comes to technical drum playing, especially in death metal or in technical death metal specifically, but he's a lot more flexible than that. What I particularly like about he, the way he uses the kicks is that he won't just drill at a certain tempo. A lot of times, just by changing the double kick speed, he will actually create grooves. You can hear this on the chorus in Shadow on an Endless Sea, on the chorus in The Cursed Muse. It's, it's on, on the outro in Lightbringer, which is like a pop song. So 
So he's very flexible. He's very, very precise and he uses it with a purpose. And he also has a lot of feel in his playing because you will get this sort of obliteratingly fast technical parts, but you will get them in alternation with things that are just used to bring dynamic, to bring feel, to set a good pace to the music. I would say the best example for this is the opening track. Well, the opening track after the intro, which is God's Debauchery, because here you get all these really fast techniques, but you get them intertwined with headbang patterns, as I like to call them, with alternations of kick and snare and tom work that just makes you headbang and makes you feel that groove. So it's like drilling and then drop and then drilling and then drop. And that's an alternation he uses a lot that I am always addicted to. I could, I could keep going, but let's switch to bass. So Peter is, well, not only a tech death bassist, but he also gets a lot of inspiration from tech death. You can hear that again on Shadow on an Endless Sea. This is the most tech death inspired song on the album. You can hear the bass sounding very akin to bands like Beyond Creation, let's say, or Obscura. And again, it has that really dramatic effect, like the, wobbly, fluid sort of bass tone doesn't just sound technical, it doesn't sound analytical. It it sounds rather like it's bending space and time, let's say. It's super epic. And then, well, he does the tech death drumming style, but he also does a lot of just power metal style rumbling on the background, which is, is it's functional, it's not something that stands out, but it's something the music needs because, well, you can't have the bass forward all the time unless you actually are beyond creation, and Spires isn't. But he does have those moments where he shines very clearly and it always has tremendous wow factor and it's placed properly. And then he has the power metal kind of playing style and he also has some more elegant, more eclectic influences going into it. I would point out the verses in Ghost of Yesterday. It's, it's a really cool, more like expressive playing style. I wouldn't know what to call it, but to me it sounds almost like the instrument is speaking to me, like with a voice. So it's that level expressive. And I happen to know, not because I have that much of a good ear, but because I saw the latest video to The Unforgotten Name, um, that he also put upright bass parts in this, which flows very well into the symphonic component of Seven Spires. There was a time when Guitar in metal is usually used for riffs. Here, its main purpose isn't riffs, despite the fact that there are a lot of riffs. So, the riffage, I don't know. Genre-wise, I would probably place it as a mix of prog power metal and death metal, let's say, riff style, but that's kind of inconclusive because Spires doesn't have, have a genre. Um, but there, there is a lot of like, Tremolo picking like you hear in black metal. There is a lot of tremolo picking like you hear in power metal. I think the difference between those is just made probably by the production or by the way the melodies of the song are placed around the riff, probably. But sometimes it sounds like power metal, sometimes it sounds like black metal. And then there's a lot of chugging riffs, there's a lot of headbanging riffs, there's a lot of diversity riff-wise. Again, if I were to focus on riffs specifically, I would probably say the best songs to really take that in are Gods of Debauchery, The Cursed Muse, and say probably um, Gods Amongst Men, Dream Chaser, the heavier songs on the album. But what actually is the main point of the guitar, as far as I'm concerned, on this album is the melodies, because almost every song has a theme, a main theme that stays in your head, which is actually what allows them to make pretty complex songs without them losing track, because they always have certain themes and motifs that they return to and that keep the listener hooked. And most of the times, the main melody of the song 
comes from the guitar. Sometimes it gets translated to orchestration or to the vocal line in the chorus, let's say, but the guitar is always there to give the epic melody that identifies the song, and that's a, a crucial element in how spires build their songs, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> And then from that melody, the solo starts, because most solos are built around it. They start with the melody and take it from there. Not all of them, but you always kind of feel the DNA of the song's theme flowing into the solo. And the solos are mad technical. I would associate his shredding style with the likes of Michael Romeo or Ivy Malmsteen, except probably less of a neoclassical influence and more of, let's say, a power metal or classic heavy metal influence. That's my sense of it. But he is that much of a shredder and he does it that well. And again, he does it with style and soul because he can somehow put a madly fast shredding solo in, for example, In Sickness In Health, which is a slower song, and not only make it work well, but actually make it sound like that's how it was supposed to be for the slower song because it contrasts with the rest of the pace and gives this rush of energy and of emotion that makes it so much so much more soulful and so much more cathartic it's the same thing again in the unforgotten name it's a slower song but there's this mad shredding in the solo placed against that slower tempo that makes it just so beautifully contrasting but somehow balanced in that contrast it's incredible And then we get to Adrian, Adrian Callan, who everyone knows she's the vocalist of this band, and I don't know how many people actually focus to think that she's also the main orchestrator of this band. After this album, they will. This album has some of the best orchestrations I've ever heard. Not only in terms of just, like, complexity and layers and, I guess, dynamic, but in the textures used, in the instruments chosen to express the intended stuff properly in in all the details it's it's complex and it's epic and it's got a wow factor but it's also very carefully looked at in detail and uh, there are i i can't analyze orchestration very well but what i would say it sounds like to me is that you often have a layer in the background that gives the scope to the song it makes it grand and powerful and epic like Spire songs are supposed to be. And then you have the dynamic elements. You have these probably string sections, I think, that are swirling up and down and doing all these motions that get you involved like in a cinematic soundscape. For me, if I'm to take, for example, my favorite orchestral moment, I would say, is in the bridge of Ghost of Yesterday. If I look at that moment, it feels like for example, an image that I could associate to is that there's some sort of goal, like a ghost spinning around me, and I'm chasing it. And and it's there, and then it's there, and it's just moving. So that's the effect that the music has. It's always moving, and it's always keeping you hooked and looking after it. So the orchestrations are phenomenal. A apart from string sections, we hear, we hear some orchestral percussion, we hear wind instruments, even some more organic wind instruments here and there. And then, as far as vocals go, well... She can do the power metal belting with the grit, like full on volume. She can do like softer singing style, like no grit at all, super clean. I would almost innocent, I would say. Again, I would give as an example the vocals in Ghost of Yesterday. And sometimes she goes to more operatic soundscapes registers, though I wouldn't say that's her main thing, but she can touch there when it's needed. And she, she will do like chanting. You can hear sorts of chanting background layers, a lot of background layers that I think are layered a lot by her, but maybe also by, um, her vocal teacher, uh, da David Akerson. I know when there's male choirs that that was his participation. Ash to ash. Dust to dust. At least. 
on the singles. I knew that was the case, so I assume it's also throughout the rest of the album. But she has a lot of diversity in techniques, and those were just clean vocal techniques that I listed, but then you get into the harsh vocals, and you have, like, really low, filthy gutturals, and you have, like, black metal-style shrieking, and it's... the contrast between those is so crazy that you can have an fully harsh vocal driven song like Gods of Debauchery for example that only has one pseudo clean vocal verse I would say which that's basically in between clean and harsh but for the most part it's a harsh vocal song and yet it has a lot of vocal dynamics and a lot of diversity because it changes from really fast singing to like more longer notes and from high pitched screaming to lower stuff and it's just got this dynamic and changing and then when she also does the same contrast between harsh and cleans it's brains explode so yeah that's all mad talent on everyone in the band like you cannot deny that and still i i can list all these things and doesn't really feel like i'm talking about what this album really is about because this album is about the soul you can hear that the techniques and like the wide range of techniques and extremity of them th they're all just tools to convey the right emotion and the right imagery and the story across what the story sounds like to me is basically when i hear wanderer's prayer which is the intro to the first track gods of debauchery what it looks like to me is like a character i would put it as he's in the darkest pits of hell so basically there's a character that's in a really, really dark place and decides to look up. That's what it means to me. There are the lyrics, um, May winds fill my sails and stoke the fires in my heart. It's like the whole song is basically driven on anger and hatred and then you have this lyric into it and it's like what that looks like for me is like from this dark place with no hope you decide to take flight and move on. And that's actually what the album feels like because you have those emotions permeating through, let's say, the first half of the album, these darker emotions, but they, as the album progresses, start getting intertwined with other things. Like, in The Cursed Muse, it's the song that comes right after, it's still quite disenchanted and dark, but it has, let's say, like a longing tone to it in the chorus as well. And then Lightbringer, which is the party song, it's rather like a cynical party song, so there we have we have already like let's say a struggle between happier vibes and darker vibes these more positive or let's say at least ambiguous emotions are starting to creep in as the album progresses and then we get to this god is dead which is a 10 minute monster and it's already been released i hope you heard it if you haven't do it um and i would say that that song is like the tipping point because all the darkness rushes through again especially on i think it's the fourth part because it's a multi-part song and it's like a fully black metal driven part with a lot of really dark nihilistic lyrics and screaming and from that with a typical dovas transition with four strums on the snare it flows straight into like the most epic melody and that moment to me sounds like liberation i would say <laughs> And then from there onwards, the album kind of still feels like a struggle, but until then it was, to me, it felt more like a doubtful struggle and afterwards it's more like a confrontational struggle. It's more determined. When you take the music in and you take the concept in, it almost feels like you can make it about yourself. And I think that's the point. I think apart from enjoying the nuts out of this album, you draw more from it than just enjoyment. I think that comes from a place that is not only creative but actually personal and emotionally vulnerable and that shows that this band isn't just musically proficient but they have the right approach to doing things. They're, they're honest, they're true to themselves and they're letting that show and it shines in every second of every song. Every Every note has their true selves put into it, and you can feel that. So, that's most of what I can say. It doesn't cover, it doesn't cover what this album is. 
you can't cover what this album is because it's a lot to take in and because it can't really be put into words. But it is most of what I can say about it. To close, I would like to choose some favorite songs and maybe give some for fans all like some similarities. So if I were to pick my favorite songs, well, it would be the whole album. But if you would force me to choose some favorite songs, it would be Shadow on an Endless Sea, This God is Dead, and The Final Three. Jim Chaser, Through Half Life. Through Half Lives. Through Lifetimes, and Fall With Me. So those songs are my favorites. And as band similarities, I would definitely list Dimu Borgir, Beyond Creation and Obscura, just for the tech death influences that Peter and Chris bring to the mix. Camelot, for like the power metal and melodic style. And after I list all these names, it's still just Seven Spires. It's them. It's not... They, they took inspiration from a lot of great names, but they've made their own sound. And they tell their own story. And that, I think, is the most important thing. That I don't think I've ever heard an album like this. It's a full-on masterpiece, and you're not ready for it. And if you have a soul, you will probably cry. Get your tissues ready. I said this before. I'm saying it again. Get your damn tissues ready. That's Gods of Debauchery. I'm done fangirling. I'm curious to know what you think about the album. So once you hear it, pop in the comments, let me know. And um, yeah, let's make a chat about this. Um, thank you very much for stopping by. I hope you enjoyed your stay. And I'd love to see you back at the windmill very soon. Corpse out. <laughs>